journalists are kept under close surveillance. To go to North Korea is to accept the presence 24 hours a day of guides who are guarantors of the country's good image. The law must be respected. We do not allow French journalists to go out alone. Our country, North Korea, does not like the French. Why? Because they took part in anti-North Korean operations. There never were any French operations against North Korea. But in Pyongyang's eyes, every foreigner is a potential enemy who has to be closely watched. It's the sworn duty of each guide to chaperone the visitor and regurgitate the regime's propaganda. Even these official North Korean guides may not be filmed. During our stay, we will be confined to our Pyongyang hotel with absolutely no chance of being allowed to go out into the city unaccompanied. So, Mr. Han, what are we going to do? What now? Going for a stroll. Where? Here. In the hotel? Yes, in the hotel. Maybe we could go into town. No. Having spent several hours wandering around the hotel lobby, we finally get authorization to go out. Any trip is pre-programmed and serves the objectives of the propaganda machine. The house where the founder of the nation was born reminds foreigners of President Kim Il-sung's heroic deeds and helps to affirm the family's legend. Uh, when she was 14 years old, the president left his native home, Man Gyeongde, firmly determined not to return before Korea became independent. Since then, the president led the 20-year-long arduous anti-Japanese armed struggle to a shining victory and finally liberated our country. So our country Hundreds of North Korean soldiers are taking part in a mandatory pilgrimage to honor the eternal president's memory. From the grandfather, Kim Il-sung, to the present incumbent, his grandson Kim Jong-un, the leaders are as one in official pronouncements. Well, we now have the respected comrade Kim Jong-un as our supreme commander. He is exactly like the President Kim Master and the great general Kim Jong-il in his idea, leadership and in his humanity. So our Korea will always emerge victorious in the future too under the wise leadership of the respected Marshal Kim Jong-un. We've been given authorization to visit Pyongyang to film the capital's latest infrastructures. The authorities are keen to airbrush the image usually associated with this country. A totalitarian regime, a family dynasty, and brutal repression. This shiny, brand new hospital is exactly the sort of publicity the regime wants. On the 3rd of November last year, Marshal Kim Jong-un visited our hospital. He was very happy. He said he felt like he was walking into a palace. Look at that chandelier up there. That is our emblem. It represents a woman's bust. This is the room which our glorious leader Kim Jong-un visited on the 3rd of November. Come in. This is the bed the marshal sat on when he came here. He asked how long the patients stay here. And Marshal Kim Jong-un sent us this 42-inch television the day after his visit. So you sleep here, is that right? You're a patient here? Yes. Do you speak French? A little. What a stroke of luck. The first patient we meet and she speaks French. How much longer are you going to be staying here? A week should be enough, I think. Wearing her hospital clothes, this patient is giving the performance of her life in this well-directed play. Is that a power cut? 
But reality soon kicks in again. Do you often have power cuts? No, very rarely. The hospital's employees do their best to remain unmoved by such events. Nothing can tarnish the image of the country and those who run it. As I said to you this morning, our country is at loggerheads with the USA, Japan and South Korea. So we need a strong military. Many soldiers to defend the fatherland. There is always tension in the Korean peninsula. And Commander Kim Jong-un is very young. He has declared, if our enemies dare to light even the smallest fuse of a war, Korea will strike a lethal blow, which will definitively unite the country. Reunification of our nation is the most fervent wish of every Korean. This desire for reunification dates from the end of the Korean War in 1953, when the peninsula was split into two countries. But no peace treaty was ever signed. Officially, the two Koreas are still at war. North Korea was subsequently run by Kim Il-sung until 1994, and then by his son, General Kim Jong-il, who died on the 17th of December, 2011. Kim Jong-un, son of the late Kim Jong-il, has been in power for three years. In life or in death, the Kim dynasty's power over 24 million North Koreans endures. The Kim family is the first communist dynasty in history. The new incumbent was presented to the people as a natural successor. Barely 30 years old, Kim Jong-un was quickly awarded the titles of Supreme Commander and then Marshal, and set about consolidating his power. Kim Jong-un's accession to power gave birth to a new hope in the hearts of the North Korean people. More of a modernist than his father, he built theme parks and was accompanied at public appearances by his wife. No North Korean leader had ever been seen to be so liberal before. Kim Jong-un cultivated his image right down to his posture, which was designed to be reminiscent of his grandfather's. Propaganda has now established him as the third strongman of the North Korean nation. The leader is the country's brain and the people are its body. Our guide is here to remind us of this. Marshal Kim Jong-un is exactly like General Kim Jong-il in his human virtues, his political leadership and his philosophy. Therefore, everybody respects and idolizes him. The guide's rhetoric is always the same. Under Kim Jong-un, devotion to the leaders remains almost religious. Like all transient foreigners, we are constrained by the regime's demands. Before, we thought of them as leaders or heads of state. 
Now, we think of them as our family's fathers, be it children or old people, be it men or women, the entire Korean nation considers them to be our fathers. In his three years of absolute power, Marshal Kim Jong-un, like his father and grandfather before him, has become part of the intimate fabric of Korean families. This retired scientist and her granddaughter are typical of this devotion to the regime. What are your feelings towards the marshal? Like everyone else, I feel that Marshal Kim Jong-un is the embodiment of our destiny. He is our future and a father to us all. You foreigners could never understand how much we venerate our marshal. The whole Korean population places its future and destiny in his hands. It is thanks to Marshal Kim Jong-un that I am wealthy and can live like this. In fact, maybe you know the song which speaks of the rise of our young nation and tells how our country will be built by the people under the guidance of comrade Kim Jong-un. Thanks to him, our future will be brilliant and socialism will triumph. How about a song? You see, even little children miss the marshal, so they salute him in their songs. Your granddaughter, who just sang, she's two years old. What kind of future do you want for her? What kind of country will she live in? I feel sure that she will live in a strong and prosperous country that will incarnate the might of Mount Bektu. That she will live in a world where she will have no cause to envy others. She already goes to a good nursery and will go to the free high school and university. We hope she's going to be a scientist like her grandfather. We would like her to contribute to our nation's developments in science and technology under the guidance of Marshal Kim Jong-un. Under Kim Jong-un, the nation's future elite is being coached in Pyongyang's model schools. Here, the children of families close to the nucleus of power will one day become musical virtuosi. We teach the children piano, but out of 30 pupils, only a few will be selected for the National Academy of Music. Some will become pianists, and others will just become composers or singers. Our junior school gives out these red stars as rewards to children for good work. And when they see these stars, it also makes them want to join the army. In this way, youth is molded to the regime's ideology from an early age and plays a vital role in its propaganda. The children have to be adorable. They are cosseted and well-fed. These are the regime's privileged few, the keepers of its eternal future.
From infant school through to university, devotion to the leader seems unfailing. But all the parades, songs and smiles hide another reality. The images that we filmed in North Korea give no insight into how this enigmatic country really works. Only North Korean refugees who have fled their homeland can genuinely shed light on the country's everyday life. What your footage shows is children who are all at the same level. The ones who lead the parades on the streets of Pyongyang are psychologically groomed throughout their time at school. And usually, they have access to better facilities, owing to their parents' position, because it's a privilege to lead parades like this through the streets of the capital. The difference between the kids from Pyongyang and the kids from the countryside is their size. The children from the capital are much bigger than the country kids of the same age. This is due to lack of protein in their diet. Now a whole host of new songs glorifying Kim Jong-un is being taught to the children. And they teach them to us, their parents. If children sing any song that is in any way critical of North Korean socialism, they are censured in front of their classmates. This indoctrination of youth is an absolute priority. At the heart of this education lies a rabid patriotism. These children are the future of North Korea and have to be ready to defend their nation. These mass spectacles are designed for the North Korean nation to promote its sense of power. These 20,000 young participants are all members of families fiercely loyal to the regime. These Pyongyang citizens are an essential part of the regime's rhetoric, at its very core. Students, teachers, and high-ranking military officers whose loyalty is beyond question. These men and women from the capital's elite are the only people allowed to meet foreigners. Like the Park family, a couple of university professors hand-picked by our guides. The Park family's exemplary conduct has enabled them to move into this block of flats. I'm still emotional talking to you now. We used to live on Mansedong Hill over there, in a flat on the 15th floor of a building, where those two statues of our leaders are. We were given this apartment on the 2nd of July 2012. Marshal Kim Jong-un came to visit us on the 4th of September 2012. He looked at every room, even the bathroom. He turned on the tap and the water ran freely, so he was very pleased. I couldn't believe how lucky I was to be able to live in a flat like this. When our Marshal Kim Jong-un visited us, I even asked him, dear leader, why is it that a family like ours is allowed to live in such a luxurious apartment? The marshal said, in our society, teachers and their families are the people who are entitled to the greatest respect. If people like you can't benefit from living in a place like this, then who can? You deserve to live here. That's what the marshal told me. A model flat for a model family. Happiness, North Korean style, is, like everything else, stage managed. In order to ensure their loyalty and to disguise the iron rod hanging over the population, 
Kim Jong-un has transformed Pyongyang into a shop window for the regime's privileged few. Our Marshal Kim Jong-un is trying to ensure that all our people can enjoy a happy life. He wants the people to be able to live in a civilized country, a civilized and socialist country. It is his will and his intention that the people may one day enjoy a very modern lifestyle. This shows that we're trying to develop not just the leisure industry, but also sport, healthcare and culture. We're trying to live in a more civilized world, basically. The despot Kim Jong-un has decreed the North Koreans should have fun. The country has supposedly entered a new era with fun for everyone. At least, that's the image that the authorities want to display to foreign visitors. On the outskirts of Pyongyang, this equestrian center is Marshal Kim Jong-un's latest creation. This equestrian center is for the benefit of everybody, workers, employees, old people, and even small children. <laughs> Nothing is left to chance. There's no room for improvisation. I'm on my way. They want to see the merry-go-round, get everything ready quickly and let the others know. We're on our way. The horse symbolizes North Korea's power. If you believe what the North Koreans say, the Kim family comes from a long line of horsemen. The legend surrounding the supreme leader continues. Between 1990 and today, Marshal Kim Jong-un got on a horse 300 times, advised and coached by General Kim Jong-il. He worked very hard at it. In order to become a great horseman, he studied and read many books which enabled him to master every aspect of horse riding. That's why he's such an expert now. The myth surrounding Kim Jong-un borders on the grotesque. Indoctrination seeps into every aspect of life. Our presence here serves to export this ultra-propaganda across the country's borders. The role journalists play is very important. That's why we're taking the documentary you are making of our country so seriously. We hope that you will take what we have told you and turn it into a fair and objective documentary. Part of the schedule for the day is a visit to Marshal Kim's latest folly a ski resort 200 kilometers from Pyongyang. His time studying in Switzerland gave him a taste for winter sports. The regime has spent $300 million on the construction of this complex. But Kim Jong-un has also achieved his objective of circumventing the embargo on leisure goods imposed by the international community. We have 10 ski slopes here at the Masik Resort, nine for professional skiers and one for beginners. We started building these slopes in May 2013 and we finished on the last day of December 2013. That's what the marshal required and we achieved it. Our leader even promoted our resort all over the world. Skiing is part of our country's culture, and so Kim Jong-un wanted this resort built to develop our civilization. But who in North Korea can afford the luxury of a holiday here? No one is willing to explain the circumstances of their stay here. The resort was designed with the people in mind, and the prices too have been set with the people in mind. In Marshal Kim Jong-un's socialist country, money remains a taboo subject. Only 5,000 North Koreans are estimated to have the means to use this resort.
In the opinion of this North Korean refugee, these new facilities are unacceptable. It's all so ridiculous. People are starving to death, and these facilities are only for rich people from Pyongyang and no good to anyone else. The reality is that people in North Korea are suffering. When I see all these leisure facilities being built, I think to myself that it's just to placate the people and show people abroad that the country is capable of achieving these things. All the money spent on building these things could have been redistributed throughout the population. This is just throwing money out of the window. North Korea's economic difficulties do not stop the regime from spending money hand over fist. Every two years, Pyongyang puts on a film festival open to foreigners. This is a way for the authorities to present an image of cultural and material prosperity to the world. We declare the 13th Pyongyang International Film Festival open. The films and cartoons shown all follow the party line, of course. This amenability towards the world outside North Korea is limited and tributes to the leader are never far away. This event is all the more important because it only takes place thanks to the interest and the love that Marshal Kim Jong-un has for the cinema. You're about to watch films which are completely innovative in both form and content. North Korean cinema has a central role in the propaganda machine. It educates even before it entertains. The film festival also allows the regime to present itself in a good light, a message relentlessly driven home by the Ministry of Culture. We want independence, friendship and peace between peoples. All over the world? Yes, all over the world. A select group of dignitaries and a few foreigners are being treated to a soiree orchestrated by the great and good of the regime. But behind this facade of a smiling, prosperous North Korea, the regime maintains control over every citizen's life. In this country of supreme leaders, even the smallest event is an opportunity to pay tribute to the leadership. Under North Korea's totalitarian system, there is no other choice. To commemorate the 60th anniversary of the end of the Korean War, 
the population of Pyongyang is requisitioned to pay tribute to its army. General Kim Jong-il said, to safeguard our country, one can live without candy, but one cannot live without bullets. Our guide's words are directly influenced by the Songun doctrine, devised by the former leader Kim Jong-il, which gives the army the dominant role in building North Korea's socialism. Like his father, Kim Jong-un perpetuates the tradition of large public parades. In this way, he sets the scene for his own power and that of North Korea. The army is the keystone of the regime with a million North Koreans enlisted and a third of the population reservists. These parades are quite remarkable. I think they used to do something similar in the former USSR. What leaders Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il taught us was a style of military marching called the Hell March, which dated from the end of the war with Japan. It's a style that Kim Il-sung was already using when he fought the Japanese. The idea is to intimidate the enemy. When you do a hopping goose step like that, it's rough on the stomach. When we trained, we were told to wear two leather belts done up very tightly under our belly. This pushed up your stomach, which you can imagine is very painful. I took part in training for these parades while I was a student at military college. But a few days before the parade, I contracted paralysis in my legs because of the hopping. So I was unable to take part and had to go back to college. The training is extremely hard. It felt like being a prisoner in a labor camp. And in North Korea, not to be able to take part in the parades is very shameful. In order to establish his authority over the army and the party, Kim Jong-un took his inspiration from the darkest days of Stalinism. In December 2013, the young dictator began a violent purge of the state's apparatus. Any officials who could have got in his way were brutally eliminated, beginning with his own uncle, Jan Song-tek, who was very influential at the heart of the regime. The Special Military Tribunal of the Ministry of State Security of the Republic of Korea has found the accused, Jang Song-tek, guilty of acts of subversion against the state. His goal was to overthrow the power of the proletariat by aligning himself with our ideological enemies. This crime carries the severest penalty under Article 60 of our penal code. This upstart, this traitor to the revolution, is condemned to death. The decision is to be implemented with immediate effect.
Jiang Song Tech was shot, according to the party line, for fomenting a coup d'etat. He was said to be overly immersed in commercial activities with China. Any hope of the regime relaxing its approach was definitively snuffed out. Kim Jong-un has asserted himself as a warlord. His frequently bellicose directives are followed to the letter by North Korea's soldiers. After the Kim Jong-un regime took power, training became more and more intense. He was determined to crush South Korea by force. He was very insistent on the weapons we had to use and ordered us to use all our ammunition on every training drill. I remember the directives changing when he took over. We had to go up into the mountains more and more often for training sessions, two or three times a week. And everything changed from a military equipment point of view. We got new and better munitions, like armor-piercing bullets. I think Kim Jong-un wants to prove to Koreans that he is capable of preparing the country for a war against South Korea. Marshal Kim Jong-un regularly challenges his southern neighbor and enemy. The regime's belligerent rhetoric goes hand in hand with provocative acts such as nuclear trials or military maneuvers. The state needs an enemy to justify the economic priority given to the military. This policy operates with no regard for the population which outside Pyongyang is still vulnerable. Between 1994 and 1998, the country suffered its worst ever famine, which caused the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. At that time, I was a soldier, and I had some serious health issues. I'd lost a lot of weight. I remember that opposite my barracks, there was a woman who used to deliver food to the Labour Party cells. I went to see the farm manager and pleaded with him to give me some apples. I said, give me an apple before I starve to death. So he said, you can eat what you like when you're here, but you can't take anything with you. Otherwise, all the other soldiers will end up coming here and your superiors will confiscate your food. I lived on an apple in the morning and an apple in the evening for several months. Nowadays, there are no great famines, but lack of food is still the main thorn in the regime's side. A third of the country's population suffers from malnutrition and is dependent on a public food distribution system. The state buys cereals and other foodstuffs from the farmers at a low price and then redistributes them among the population. Depending on the number of people in the family, they get more or less food. More is given to families where there are adults. The regime is still incapable of feeding its people, but is keen to convince us that the opposite is true. Our journey now takes us on a visit to a naturally exemplary farm. These are the details commemorating our visits from General Kim Jong-il, who came 15 times to give us new instructions. His advice when he was here enabled us to improve production. He was very pleased. The general said, at first, the soil here was bad, but the good work of our farmers has allowed us to increase productivity. General Kim Jong-il himself said that our farm should become a model to the rest of the country. This model farm looks more like a ghost farm. According to the manager, 850 farmers work here. We do not see a single one. This dilapidated greenhouse is the regime's attempt to convince us of how modern its agricultural system is. In fact, what we produce here is mainly for the local population. We don't get involved in how many people we distribute vegetables to. There is an organization above us that calculates this and then gives us production targets for the year.
but the targets set by the authorities are unattainable. In order to help the farmers, the regime takes its inspiration from the Maoist model and sends the army into the fields. As soon as our training is over, we go into the country to work with the farmers. We usually help with pricking out rice or planting corn. Every regiment is billeted to a farm near its barracks. The commanding officer might say, this barracks, you go to this farm or whatever. After the corn harvest at the end of October or beginning of November, we return to barracks to start our winter training. In March 2012, Kim Jong-un introduced a reform which allowed farmers to keep half of what they grew. But a lack of fertilizer and farm tools prevents the country from being self-sufficient, and this fundamental principle remains out of reach. The regime seems to continue supporting a systematic economic path. But today, it no longer has any choice but to tolerate private commercial ventures. We still struggle economically. There are still obstacles to overcome, but under our marshal's leadership, everyone can enjoy a stable lifestyle. The regime has succeeded in maintaining this stability by cutting off its population from the outside world. Only a handful of North Koreans managed to get around this isolation via the black market. There are smugglers who regularly cross the Two Men River on the Chinese border and bring back contraband. I went into business with a bunch of friends, and I remember everyone copying and burning South Korean DVDs brought in from China and then selling them in the markets. In North Korea, buying DVDs like this is expressly forbidden and goes against the regime and the law. It is actually dangerous to even own them. But there are fewer controls in the evening, so people get together around 10 or 11 and stay up until dawn watching recordings of popular TV series. I remember a very popular South Korean series which showed a casino in a capitalist country. You saw money changing hands, which we'd never seen before. Because all you see on North Korean television is documentaries about Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. And it's still the same today. But in those South Korean series, I saw apartments and wardrobes full of clothes and shoes. The North Korean regime keeps on telling us that South Koreans are very poor. But the people in those series were really fashionably dressed, and I loved it. According to these refugees, this new merchant elite could be the catalyst for change within the country. This may explain why control over the population has increased since Kim Jong-un's accession to power. North Koreans have absolutely no chance of leaving the country legitimately. So despite the risk, many try clandestinely to cross the border into China. The first time I fled North Korea, I met a middleman when I arrived in China and was sold to a Chinese farmer. When you're on Chinese soil, you're considered an illegal immigrant and not a refugee. I ended up getting caught and the Chinese authorities sent me back to North Korea. I was sent to a labor camp for a year. I was beaten for three days. The first few days are meant to frighten you and make you confess your crimes. Once you've confessed, you're sent to a labor camp or to prison. When they were torturing me, they prevented me from sleeping. And they hit me here, in the eye. When I was a border guard on the Two Men River, it was my job to catch fugitives. We were posted along the Chinese border in groups of three. 
When we caught a fugitive, we took them to our guard post, where we recorded the time and date at which we'd captured them. Then the fugitive was interrogated by our boss and transferred to the Department of Security. If the prisoner was starving, we could be lenient. Otherwise, they were sent straight to prison or the labor camp. All I did was hand them over to my superiors. We were rewarded for each fugitive we caught. I stopped about eight people from escaping across the Tumen River into China. If you catch one fugitive, you get a medal. If you catch five in the same year, the Labour Party awards you prizes and even holidays so that you can go home and see your family. Once I left prison, I wondered how I was going to carry on living with no identity. I was considered a traitor to the nation, so I had no future in North Korea. I tried to flee a second time. I had obtained contact details for a people trafficker while I was in prison. Thanks to him, I managed to cross the Tumen River between China and North Korea. With the fake passport he made me, I got on a boat to South Korea the following day. The ruthlessness of the regime and the disastrous economic situation have forced over 200,000 North Koreans to flee their country. 25,000 have made it to South Korea. Despite some early hope, Kim Jong-un's accession to power has not changed the nature of the regime. Never before has the contrast between the reality of this country and the image it tries to portray been so glaringly obvious.